Hi, everyone. Welcome to one in a series of videos created in partnership with the Rehab Center for Children and the Child Development Clinic. These videos are intended for caregivers and parents who have a child uh, waiting for services at Special Services for Children and Youth, also known as Sky. My name is Lisa Bissett. I'm one of the social workers at the Child Development Clinic. And here with me is Chris Fraze who is an Hi. occupational therapist. So welcome everyone. We'd like to start with a, a bit of a mindful moment and we would invite you just to, um, just to stop for a minute, become aware of your body in, in the chair or wherever you are. You may wanna lower your gaze or even close your eyes if that feels okay. And take a couple of deep breaths. Just notice the breath coming in and the breath leaving, allowing yourself to settle and arrive here at this moment. This kind of pausing is something that you can do at any time to help yourself um, settle and be present. It's a form of self-care um, that we encourage anyone to do um, whenever you're feeling uh, stressed or just, or just need a moment to catch your breath. We'll be talking a little bit more about self-care later on in this video. Before we go any further, we want to acknowledge that we are located in Treaty 1 territory, the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Ininuak, Ithinuak, Denisuvan, Anishinaabeg, Inuit, Dakota, and Nakota peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We also want to acknowledge that our water is sourced from Troll Lake 40 First Nations. This seminar is a general overview of child development. Other sessions will in the series will focus in on areas of communication, toilet training, uh, challenging behavior, picky eating, and sleep. Each of the sessions will be based on uh, our favorite words of child development. This is a framework that was uh, developed by Dr. Peter Rosenbaum and his colleagues at Can Child Research Center. This framework is a holistic model that considers the child at the center and focuses on participation. It includes six words that each begin with F. The first word is family. You as your child's family and whoever you consider part of your family um, knows your child best. And so it's important that service providers listen to you and hear what your priorities are and respect your concerns. Function, kids learn through trying and doing. It's not important necessarily how they get things done, but they have the opportunity to try. Friends, having childhood friends is important. Um, and so allowing the opportunities for kids to engage with other kids in ways that work for them in a variety of environments can help facilitate that building of friendships. Fun. Childhood is all about fun and play, and this is how kids learn and grow. Allowing opportunities for kids to engage in whatever activities bring them joy can help them to develop a variety of skills. Fitness, it's important that we all have opportunities to stay fit and active. And so finding ways that your child can participate, uh, no matter their physical abilities, can help with building that fitness. And future. Uh, we all have hopes and dreams for our kids and uh, we can set long-term goals about participation in um, their communities, but also short-term goals and steps along the way. And each of those is valid and important. And we wanna consider your goals as well as what your child wants to be when they grow up or tomorrow or next week or next month.
The first favorite word we're going to look at is family. Of course, we know that families come in all shapes and sizes, and they are the first environment for most children. And you as caregivers are their first teachers and their first experience of relationships. Families give us our roots and experiences within the family often will shape how your child sees the world. Before we get into different aspects of the family, we also want to recognize that um, if you think about the family as a nest uh, and that what, what is that foundation made out of, it can include things like stability, health, security, sort of the basics of uh, food and shelter. In some cases, it might also involve childcare. And our family is supported by these things and needs these things to, to function well. Sometimes if a piece of this is being challenged or missing or changing, uh, the focus shifts to, to address these things. And it's, it's difficult to think about also sort of focusing on uh, your child's development uh, when, when you're not sure about how you're going to manage some of these other things. And if you find that you are struggling with, with any of these pieces, we will be attaching a, a, a link to some resources that, um, that may be able to help you. Thinking about unique families, uh, your family is however you define it. It may be biological, it may be uh, people you've chosen, you may have a blended family, you, know, you may be co-parenting, you may be a single parent, um, you might consider your community supports to be part of your family, as well as your extended family. Um, some families are, are quieter, some families are big and boisterous. Um, whatever, whatever you call family um, is right for you. Our elder Mary uh, defines family as uh, whoever uh, whoever is in your circle where there are connections to the heart. We also recognize that you are the experts in your, uh, on your child. Often during an assessment, a lot of the information is based on, uh, or is, that is gathered, is gathered from the caregivers because you, you spend most time with them and, and you, you've seen them develop and grow. You know what their strengths and interests are, and sometimes that can be a bit difficult to, to um, suss out, but we'll be talking a little bit about, about that uh, down the road. Um, parents are often the ones that will need to advocate for their children to get the resources that, um, that will help them. And this picture of the, the, this um, mama bear is, uh, I think represents the way uh, many of us feel at times when you're standing up for, your, standing up for and protecting your child. You might wanna take some time to reflect on what you need and how, how we here can help. Thinking about the uniqueness of your family, we also know that what, what's important to one family is not necessarily important to another. Um, one, one family may value academic success and another may uh, want their children to um, be good citizens or um, you know, be able to make friends easily. Not to say that one, excludes the other, but what, uh, what you're wanting your child to work on, it may, it may vary from family to family. You, you may be the kind of family that values independence and wants to teach your child how to manage on their own, um, or you may, be, uh, you may want to sort of be at, um, offer some guidance, or it's important for you that they fit in rather than that they're discovering things on their own. None of these differences is good or bad. We just want to recognize that you have your own uh, priorities for your child and that, um, that it doesn't mean that, you know, it, you're less loving or a different family is less loving. It's just a different expression of, of how you spend time as a family, what your traditions, values, and beliefs are, um, and what you value.
The other piece of family is the circle around the family or the helpers. Sometimes people have difficulty asking for help um, and some people are quite private and, and don't want to. Others are okay with sharing some of the challenges they're having. I like this quote from Ann Douglas, which says, um, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to support that child's parent. So maybe think about who, who beyond your sort of nuclear or extended family is, is, could make up that circle. Maybe community, uh, school or daycare, the clinicians uh, and programs here at, at Sky, elders or other community leaders and specialists. The next uh, um, favorite word that we're going to look at is fun. And fun for a child uh, means play. Play is their job. Um, it benefits learning in all areas, uh, your sensory input, emotions, developing creativity and problem solving, and also language skills. Uh, you want to, as, as caregivers, you want to think about what are, what sparks their interests? What are, what are they motivated to do? And that can be a gateway to mastering different, different tasks. So when I talk about magnets, you wanna think about, you know, what, what does your child love to do? Um, do they like to run and jump? Are they really interested in using their, the, the, the gross motor skills? Do they like to uh, play with cars or trucks? Do they like swimming? Do they like counting? So finding the thing that interests them, and of course it may be more than one thing, and then uh, building on that to, so that you can join their world. This little girl uh, clearly is enjoying, enjoying water play. And this other little one, um, their dad has uh, sort of grabbed one of those rings that they're holding and is, is inviting that kind of um, interaction that can continue to build social skills, communication, and other, other pieces. So think for a minute, you know, what is it that, you, you know, what your child is interested in, it may not be the things that, that you're interested in. So putting those aside and just getting down on the floor and being a bit of a detective. Play and fun can happen no matter where you are. Um, it could be something formal. It can also, there are lots of opportunities just throughout the day to to have fun you can um you know here we have some examples of exploring nature you know going to the park uh, you may, you may, there may be a neighborhood splash pad and some drop-in programs as well so you can look at different environments including including home of course where you can um you can help your child in their development and again also maybe identify some, some new magnets for, your, for them. So function. Uh, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, function is about trying, learning, and feeling successful. We each have different ways of doing things and ways of getting things done. And it's not important necessarily how kids get things done, but that they are given the opportunity to try. So when looking at child development, there are some typical progressions of milestones, but these actually vary between different cultures. And so we're not going to talk about specific ages where things should be happening by, but instead we're going to look at some general patterns of progression that happen along the way. In general, like I said, certain skills come before others, um, but not every child goes through every stage. Our focus is generally on finding what a child can do and moving from there. When a task is too challenging for a child, um, we can try and break it down into smaller little pieces um, so that they can feel success along the way. So just because they're not doing the final task of putting socks on um, doesn't mean that they can't help pull it up at the end or um, get it started on their toes or 
pick two matching pairs of socks or just pick two pairs of socks, uh, two socks. Um, there's all sorts of little different steps along the way that we can help our child feel success. Um, we've divided this section into different parts of development. And so you can see along the right side there, so we have social, emotional, cognitive, physical, and communication. And so we'll talk about some of the general pieces that fall into each of those areas. And generally, kids have an area that is maybe stronger than another area. And so sometimes we can use those areas of strength to support kids to develop skills in areas that are a bit more challenging for them. The first area of development that we're going to talk about is social development. Typically, infants are drawn to their parents' uh, faces and the sounds that they make, and they're curious and they feed off the reactions of other people in their environment. As they get a little bit older, they move in towards Im imitating others and engaging in interactions with people around them. That might be turn-taking, that might be um, not taking turns as in board games, but taking turns as in making a silly face or making a little noise and then waiting for a response. That can be babbling back and forth. We'll talk about more about that in communication, but that turn-taking of activity um, is an early social skill. Um, and then as they get a bit older and they're able to interact with other kids in their environment, you may see parallel play. So sharing with other kids at this age um, can be tough. And so instead of playing together, they play alongside each other. And this is a way of figuring out where they fit with other kids and figuring out how to negotiate that. As they get a bit older and develop a few more skills with your help as a family member, as um, with your help, uh, then they would learn some turn taking and participate in some imaginative play maybe with others and move towards cooperation. So building um, games and activities together. Um, this can be a challenge for most preschoolers to some degree. And so um, it doesn't always go smoothly, but it is part of the developmental process. And then as they get older, they learn to take someone else's point of view. So they get a little bit more empathy and, and may understand um, why someone else might be sad or why someone else might be happy. And they may decide to share a toy to help make someone else happy. So those are all progressions along the steps of social development. And they support other areas of development like communication, as I was mentioning, um, and engagement with others. Some ways that we can support social development are um, the baby games that we play early in life. So peekaboo and smiling back and forth and making silly sounds are all some early social development activities. As kids get older, we can offer opportunities for play groups and exposure to other kids um, and allow them to find their fun together. So they may, as in this picture, um, play alongside each other. They may focus on their own activities, but be having the opportunities to do that alongside others gives opportunities for that social development. Next, we're going to talk about emotional development. Emotions can be big, no matter the size of the child. Uh, babies initially are expressing their needs generally through crying or fussing, um, and they may be that they're tired or hungry or they have a dirty diaper. Um, as they grow, they learn to uh, express their emotions differently and regulate their emotions a little bit more based on the people around them. So you may notice that um, your infant will smile if you're smiling at them or pause and look concerned if you have a concerned look on your face. They're figuring out what each of those emotions are and um, how to express them. As they get a bit older, they progress towards expressing their own feelings and their own independence. Um, 
And that can sometimes be even bigger emotions because kids have trouble necessarily regulating big and small and loud and quiet. And so we get loud laughter and we get loud anger and we get loud everything. Um, and part of that is expressing who they are and learning to express that. And that moves on to expressing independence. So sometimes that's, no, I do, right? When you have that child who's really figuring out how to do something on their own and they don't want that help, that expression of independence can be really strong as well. But it is a natural part of learning to regulate their own emotions. As they get a bit older, they tend to gain a, a increased attention and focus for things that they enjoy. Um, so we talked a little bit about magnets. And so those things that draw their attention and that are fun for them are the things that are they're gonna have better attention and focus to. Um, and then slowly over time, as they're developing that focus and attention, they can begin to work on some of that self-regulation. Actually, at this age is co-regulation. So managing their emotions, um, having those big emotions, ups and downs, are is hard in the preschool years, and they need that adult support to co-regulate. So that might be sitting together with them when they're frustrated, or um, reading a story together when they're tired. Um, each of those things support them to find ways to manage their emotions in a way that's healthy. And so there will be a little bit more discussion about this one in the challenging behaviors um, section or presentation, but um, that's just a little sneak preview of co-regulation. So the next area we're going to talk about is cognitive skills. So these are the underlying skills um, for reading and writing and math and problem solving and reasoning. Um, so when we are talking about early cognitive skills, we're talking about simple cause and effect. So in babies, they learn that if I cry, I get a response from a caregiver and they come and change my diaper or feed me or those types of things. That's really early cause and effect. As they get older and they learn um, that they can have influence on the environment, they learn that if I drop something, I can make a game out of it and a caregiver can, will come and pick it up and I can drop it again and we can laugh together. Um, and then they might notice that if I play with a toy in a certain way, um, it does makes a certain movement or makes a certain sound. And so each of those noticings is a little piece of problem solving. And they are building their memory of what happened the last time they did that. So problem solving and memory kind of all build together and they figure out how to play and interact with their world um, by doing things and seeing what happens and remembering what happened the last time and remembering routines and the way things are done. Um, and then the next kind of area is like matching and sorting um, and finding the ways that things are similar. So that could be matching socks, as you see in this picture, but it could be also sorting toys, like putting all the cars together or matching certain colors or um, sorting cutlery and all, taking all the spoons or um, there's all sorts of ways that kids match in their daily activities. And so that's kind of the next level of problem solving and cognitive skills. And then um, another big area in, in cognitive skills is attention and kind of focusing in on a particular activity or a particular particular thing for a longer period of time allows them to build more problem solving in and figure things out and persist a little bit longer with things that are maybe challenging. So a great way to build um, attention is by using the things that kids are really interested in to help them stick with something that might be a little bit challenging. So we're back to using those magnets that our kids have to help build other skills like attention. 
Another great way to work on cognitive skills is to wonder out loud with your child. So, hmm, I wonder where that car is going, or I wonder where that bike bug is going, or hmm, what happens if I roll this car into a tower, or whatever it is in your environment. So observing what's happening and knowing kind of what's gonna come next, but instead of saying what's gonna come up next, you wonder out loud with your child about, hmm, what happens if? Um, and then that builds curiosity in your child and encourages them to try and figure out um, the answer or the problem. Um, and they may also begin to wonder out loud as well. Um, and so even if your child doesn't have words for those things, um, they may, they are still hearing what you're saying and wondering with you potentially. So um, even if your child doesn't have expressive language yet, which we'll get to, um, it still is very helpful to wonder out loud with your child. So next, we're going to talk about physical skills. We break physical development down into many different kinds of areas. Um, and so we've chosen to break them down here into gross motor, fine motor, and sensory skills. Um, and so for gross motor, generally um, kids are motivated to move and try and see what happens. So early gross motor development is full of random movements um, with increasing control and precision as they figure out how their muscles work and how they can use them in coordination. Most kids begin their gross motor skills, so that's how they get around in life, um, through rolling and sitting, then moving to crawling and walking, and then action. Um, but not all children make it through each of those stages. Some have differences in their muscle tone, so that's how tense their muscles are and how or how floppy their muscles are, and so that can affect how they participate. Um, and others may have other physical differences, um, missing limb or um, other developmental delays. And so looking at how a kid moves, we usually start with where they're at and then move on to the next kind of step that works for them. This kind of goes back to our initial comments of I might do things differently, but please let me try or try. Um, the desire to move is pretty strong in most kids. And so if they need some supports like a walker or a wheelchair or a modified piece of equipment, um, that can help them to move and participate with their friends um, and still gain that independent mobility and that ability to get around um, in their environment. Here we see some pictures of some modified bikes in the top right hand corner. Um, in the middle in the car, um, we see a girl trying out a switch to operate a motorized car. So that's looking at some power mobility. And same with on the left hand side beside the kids with the strider bikes, we see a little guy in a cat in a baseball cap uh, using um, a power wheelchair type um, piece of equipment. And all of those allow kids to explore their own independent mobility while still using the supports that are available to them. Next, we're gonna talk about fine motor skills. So this is how we use our hands um, to manipulate objects around us. Uh, in development of our hand use, we again move from big, less controlled movements, um, like reaching with two hands to get an object, um, and then moving into a little bit more refined control um, and accuracy. So that we, we move from big movements to smooth, fine movements, and then build some strength in our hands to be able to manipulate all sorts of uh, objects around us. So here we have see a variety of different examples of fine motor skills in these pictures. 
We see starting with building with blocks and some container play. We see a child feeding themselves um, with a spoon, which it takes more skill than feeding themselves with their fingers. Um, we see a child feeding pipe cleaners into um, beads and into a colander um, and using two hands in different ways. So that's kind of a next step is using both hands separately um, to manipulate objects in a little bit more complex way. And then we move on to things like um, printing and cutting um, that require a lot of precision and control in both hands. Uh, with fine motor skills, it's important to remember that we need stability before we can get really refined movements. So what that means is if you imagine sitting on or standing on a yoga ball and trying to paint a picture, you have to have really good balance to be able to then paint your picture. Whereas if you're sitting on a sturdy surface, the quality of your um, picture will probably be a lot better because you're only focusing on that one aspect rather than having to maintain your balance. And so that's how um, kids, when they're working on their fine motor skills, also need some support. So if we're asking them to practice standing or walking at the same time as we're asking them to practice beating um, on a string, that's going to be more challenging for them than if they are sitting at a little table or sitting on the floor and working on some um, fine motor skills um, and not having to focus on their balance and their control at the same time. So if kids are struggling with a task that needs the use of their hands, looking at their environment and, and giving them a little bit more support, a place, a sturdy place to sit, somewhere to lean on to, that can sometimes help with fine motor skills. Um, we have a video and it's in the resources link um, called Fine Motor Skills in Preschool Years that goes a lot more into ways that you can support your child in developing their fine motor skills. So check that out if that's an area of challenge for your child. So sensory processing is, is a big piece of child development um, and it can be pretty complex. This component is everything our bodies tell us about the world around us and the world within. So interoception is how our bodies tell us about our internal feelings of hunger and sleep, tiredness. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about um, how we learn about the world through touch and movement and vision and sound and taste. So some kids love mess and movement and noise and others feel overwhelmed by some or all of that. Um, some kids notice these inputs more than others and react more strongly while others need more of these inputs to feel regulated and grounded. So some kids really seek out a lot of movement so that they can focus and pay attention. And other kids get really distracted or overwhelmed if there's a lot going on in their environment and try and pull away from that a little bit. Um, think about how you feel um, with different sensations um, and different things that you either love or really struggle with in your environment. So how do you respond to um, a busy, noisy environment? Does it give you energy or does it drain you? How about little noises that people make or um, being on a swing or uh, something that spins? Does that um, excite you or does that make you nauseous and uncomfortable? That All of that is how your sensory system is responding to the input in the environment. And so, um, this collage of pictures shows kids exploring a variety of different sensory um, inputs. We have kids hugging, we have playing in the mud, we have standing on our head and feeling all that pressure and the weight of gravity pulling through their body. Um, 
we have kids spinning and hiding and hanging from monkey bars and all of those their bodies are interpreting the sensory information in their environment to tell them about what's going on we also see some kids that are a little bit more overwhelmed so covering their ears or covering their eyes with a toque um, those and we see the little guy getting a hug at the bottom who looks a little bit like that might be more than he's able to handle at that moment so each of these is our children showing us how they're coping with the sensory information in their environment. So our job as parents is to kind of notice their responses and to support them and to get the sensory inputs that they need. And like I said, there is another video on sensory processing in this series. And we also have an introduction to sensory processing um, video on the Rehab Center for Children website as well. So there is a couple of different resources that you can use to explore um, your child's own sensory processing needs uh, a little bit more in depth. Now interoception, we'll talk about just briefly, that's the internal sense of feeling of fullness, hunger, thirst, um, and our internal body signals. It contributes to our mood and our feeling of comfort or ease, um, but also hunger drive and toilet training can all be affected by um, that interoception. So if your child is struggling with some of those pieces, that may be a component. And so talking to your occupational therapist about that or your pediatrician um, might be helpful. So the last piece in this section of function is communication. And so I've talked a little bit about it along the way as we've gone about components for communication, but now we're gonna talk about it a bit more in depth. So there are several pieces to communication. There's the receptive, so the understanding and responding to what people are saying in the environment, um, recognizing objects that we are talking about, um, and listening to stories. Those are all receptive communication. So it's what's coming into the child and what they're hearing and understanding. Expressive communication, it can be crying or cooing um, for babies. Um, it can be gestures, words. Um, it can be asking questions or repeating words that a child has heard. So each of those pieces are communicating different things. And then we also have nonverbal communication. So behavior is communication. If we're having a child who is um, nodding or shaking their head no, we know what they mean. They're using behaviors to communicate with us. Um, they may use eye contact or glance over at us to check in and make sure that we're still there or that we see something that they're excited about. Um, turn taking and pointing and crying and tantrums, again, are all nonverbal ways of communication, but they are communication. And so um, it's important that we show our children that they're understood when they're using those forms of communication so that they can then work to deal with whatever they're trying to communicate. So sometimes if we um, ignore those behavioral cues, that can lead to frustration and um, other challenges. So in this picture, we have all sorts of actually nonverbal communication um, going on. We have a child waving, a child pointing and crying. They're obviously mad about something in the top left corner. Um, there's a child that maybe was hurt in the bottom left corner or upset about something. And then we have in the middle um, a baby looking at his mother or her mother um, smiling, showing uh, happiness. And we have a child reaching to be picked up. Um, we have a little family reading a book together. So those are all ways that we're building communication skills in our kids. And um, there is going to be a separate section on communication in one of these seminars. So I'm going to pass it over to Lisa. 
The next word we're going to explore a little bit is friends. Now, the opportunity to make friends and spend time with friends has benefits in, in so many areas. And when we think about friends, I mean, they can come from, from many different places. They can be extended family members, cousins, and so on. It could be uh, other children they meet in daycare or school. It could be neighbors, or it, it could be sort of casual, casual friends that they're meeting at the playground or through something more, more formal like a swimming lesson or soccer. Spending time with friends is a lovely way for children to build on their communication and social skills to you know, develop that back and forth that's required to, to play together. And we know, of course, that uh, you know, the, the development sort of happens in a, in a linear way and children develop at different, different ages and stages and with different strengths and challenges. We can't expect a child to go from where they where they are, say it's point A to point F, without having gone through those other steps. So these this is a ch also another chance for them to continue with their development and social skills and communication. Spending time with friends is a is a great way for children to have some unstructured time, a free play where they can just exp explore and experiment. And that might, those might be the chances for, for you if you're the adult in charge to, uh, to notice what it is that are your child's magnets. Another chance for you to put on your detective hat and, and just observe what are, what's drawing them in, what things do they seem to get quite excited about or keep wanting to play. Another benefit of friends is uh, that feeling of independence that comes from uh, spending time uh, sort of away from the, from your family and it can also help with motivation. If a child sees another child uh, doing something that they think they'd like to try, might be riding a bike or might be seeing them use a toilet, it might take some of that, that the fear out of it and it might and it might really inspire them to want to try for themselves. And fitness. So fitness isn't necessarily just about a specific sport or exercise program. It's about everyday activities. Um, there are many benefits to being active and it's a great way to have fun together um, with your child or for your child to have fun with other people. So Fitness activities will be unique to every child and unique to their physical abilities and also their preferences, those magnets that we talked about. Um, so your child may enjoy organized activities. They may enjoy individual activities. Um, and so many of them can be built into just their daily play. Um, fitness activities can help um, kids explore um, their physical limitations, they it can stretch them to try new things, and it's an opportunity for risk taking in a safe and controlled way. So we see a little guy climbing a tree um, with some supervision, and so they're working on their balance and their strength and their coordination all by climbing a tree, right? So it doesn't need to be a specific activity. Um, and it can be unique to your child. We also see a little girl here um, walking with a walker. So her fitness activity may be just getting up and walking around, um, but it still is building her strength and her endurance um, and working on her balance. Um, so finding the fun is a great way to make sure that Fitness is a lifelong activity rather than a chore. So what does your child love? What gets them excited? What can you do together as a family? So think for a moment about what your family does for fitness. Um, we see here a dance party. We see going outside and blowing bubbles together. We see bike rides and canoeing, and just going to the park. 
in the top right hand corner, there's um, an example of a calendar that a family uses um, to build variety into their um, fitness schedules. It doesn't matter how you do it, but staying active is really important for um, gross motor development, for health, and it has other benefits that we'll talk about just now. When Dr. Rosenbaum was here doing a presentation for um, pediatric therapists in Winnipeg, he talked about, or uh, he asked us a question about what sports we play and asked us to think about our skills in that area. Were we good enough to be professional athletes? And I want to just pause and ask you the same question. And for your child, is it important that they are professional athletes in whatever area that they're playing or doing? Or what are the other reasons that we participate in, in these types of in fitness activities? Is it for um, the social activity, the social engagement? Is it for the exercise? Is it for the love of the game? Or for the competition? Some people really love the competition. Um, thinking about all the benefits of activity and fitness, rather than thinking about being perfect at a specific activity or sport um, can be really helpful in building a lifelong fitness um, for us individually as adults, but also for our kids. And so I just wanted to share that little concept here um, before we move on. So mental health benefits, um, sleep benefits. So in the sleep presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about being active and how that helps with sleep. Um, but burning off some of your energy during the day can really help with staying asleep at nighttime. Um, it can be a great way to build friendships, learn about, um, your own preferences and skills and learn new skills and a good way to find joy. So to build fun into your child's life. The final word we're going to look at today is future, which is the, the next steps. We've spent some time giving an introduction to the favorite words, and you may be wondering what happens, what happens now. We would uh, want to kind of recognize that um, what we do today can set the stage for what happens in the future. You want to uh, think about building your team, whether that's professionals or maybe you, as we've been going through the, the favorite words, you've, you've noticed that maybe there are some things that you would like to enhance um, for, for your child. You can um, pick that one thing. Uh, we would suggest maybe just picking one thing so that you and your child don't, don't necessarily feel overwhelmed. And we, we want to, again, we can't stress enough the idea of building on strengths thinking about you know, what can your child do now and how can you use those, those interests and uh, the, the magnets to help your child continue with their development. I mean, they're, gonna, they're gonna grow and become whoever it is that they are supposed to become. And trying to be present on that journey uh, and, and, and celebrate the successes as they come along. We know, again, what a child learns with, with pleasure or with, while having fun, they'll, they'll be motivated to continue to do that. Life is not without its challenges. And some of those challenges may be um, how to actually create connections, whether it's uh, you know, the, the friends or, the, or uh, those opportunities for fun. You may want to look at the resource list link that we have attached to this. You may, again, talk to your informal networks and, and think about how to, how to build those. Comparing, uh, I, I just heard the quote that comparing, comparison is the thief of joy. So when we, and, and I think often we do get stuck in that comparison loop of, you know, I'm not where this other person is or my child's not, you know, at this, where, where this other child is. Um, again, thinking about, you know, 
celebrating where your child's at and recognizing that these things do happen, uh, can happen sort of incrementally. We know in social media, we're seeing other people's highlight reels and that's not always realistic. Uh, you know, I like this picture over here of the expectation of a family dinner versus the reality, which is often noisy and, and messy with, um, with exhausted parents. Trying and failing is okay. It's part of development. Um, you know, it's the way we all develop, um, thinking about, you know, the first meal you made versus the, the you know, what you're, what you're making now or riding a bike or walking. All of these things take multiple, multiple times to, to figure out. And things are always changing. Um, you think about yourself, what, you know, what hobbies and interests and things you like to do when you were 10 or 12 may not be the same things that you like to do now. Uh, maybe your, your friends group has changed. So just, just like you, your child will develop new interests and abilities that you want to kind of be attuned to and, and, and watch for. You may get information, new information about your child and, and other resources that can, that can help. We also want to think about what are your goals for your child versus what are your child's own goals. If you think about this, uh, look at this little dandelion uh, picker, uh, little girl, perhaps her parents' goals were, you know, uh, registering her in registering her for soccer were uh, some, some fitness or some fun. And she may be uh, sort of exploring and working on her fine motor skills, some of those functional pieces. Uh, she may be making she may be making friends with another little dandelion picker. So we see that a lot of times those favorite words do intersect, and they, and one may lead to another one. Just before we uh, say goodbye, we wanted to also just just touch on a little bit about self compassion and self care. We mentioned that earlier on when we took a minute to do a mindful moment where we just paid attention to our breathing and our feet on the floor. Uh, Self-compassion is the idea that we will treat ourselves and give messages to ourselves uh, similar to the way we would talk to a good friend or, or someone you know dear to us that we care about. We can often be our own worst critics and judges and so you know giving giving yourself a break and and being kind to yourself just like you would to a friend who's having similar experiences and challenges is a is a wonderful way to um, to do some self-care. you know we know other other ways that you can uh, care for yourself it may be you know taking a walk or um, you know taking just spending time with a favorite book. We also know that it's not always possible to find those those uh, longer moments to, as they say, fill your cup so that that you are also nourished and can continue to to you know participate and, and be the parent that or caregiver that you want to be. Um, so sometimes as a smaller act of self care, for example, having just having a drink of water, stopping to take a breath thinking about what is the next right thing to do here um, can, can help. A, a quick text to someone that you know is on your team. We also want to remember that uh, two steps forward and one step back is still progress. Um, just going back to that idea of celebrating successes is, is a, a great way to remind yourself that you know you, you are making progress and everything does happen in its own time. You, you know, as much as we might want this, uh, this, I think it's a bean plant to grow faster and taller or differently, um, it's going to develop the way it, it's going to develop. We can provide it with a good soil and air and water and enjoy its development. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this image at the bottom right of your screen with these two jars. Uh, these jars actually contain equal amounts of stuff. Um, the difference is in the jar on the right, uh, the, the, the bigger rocks have gone in first and then, the, and then the smaller, progressively smaller things have gone in so that it all fits. 
uh, if we think about this as a metaphor for our time and our lives, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to make everything fit in our busy lives, putting in those big rocks, the things that are important to you, your, whether it's your values, um, your, your family, and other, other parts will uh, allow you to have time for those smaller, those smaller pieces. And it looks like there might even be room in that jar to, to add a cup of coffee with a friend. So this concludes our presentation on favorite words of child development. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you did find this useful information. If you do have questions or want additional information, we would invite you to watch the other videos that are available in this series and can be found on the Rehab Center for Children website, along with a variety of resources. You may also want to, again, on the Rehab Center for Children website, sign up for the newsletters, which, can inc which include information about uh, ongoing activities here at Sky. There will also be opportunities for question and answer periods in a live online format. So if you'd like to access them, please click the link to register. And if you have concerns about your child's um, skills and feel they would benefit from an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, speech language pathologist, or audiologist assessment, then you can contact Children's Therapy Initiative and make a self-referral. The links to the referral form and their phone numbers are also available attached here on the website. Thanks so much for spending the time with us and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.